are going to look at the question of Sanskrit in the Indian educational system. And you may remember for those of you who attended the previous sessions by Professor Kapil Kapoor and Professor Srinivas Reddy so far, that the question of Sanskrit's heritage was brilliantly dealt with, but what remains to be tackled is really, why do we have a problem with the level of awareness of Sanskrit among young Indians today? And where have we failed in the educational system? So first of all, I'm going to begin with a little bit of background. We are going to look at the whole trajectory of Sanskrit, basically in post-independent India. But even before we do that, I would like to look at pre-independence India. And because the, the trajectory of Sanskrit actually starts from the colonial period, and we have to look at that briefly. In the pre-colonial period, well, Sanskrit is part of Indian life. It's part of the traditional schooling in India. Uh, a lot we have, you might not know that there were lakhs of village schools across India in pre-colonial India. So before the 19th century, let us say roughly, this is well documented by, by British officials themselves. So if you want to look at the details, you can look at Adam's reports on uh, traditional schools in India, which is early 19th century. And all this is very nicely summarized in a book by Dharampal called The Beautiful Tree, which is available on the net. And you can see that Sanskrit was part of, of, of the regular schooling and of course, higher education. Uh, and there was still a fairly substantial amount of, of Sanskrit scholarship across the country and so on. But I want to jump from this period into the colonial period because here something very important happened. And that is the discovery of Sanskrit. Now discovery, obviously not for Indians, but for Westerners and in particular, for European scholars who were very keen to understand this civilization. So there were various degrees of prejudices. Some thought that Indian civilization was actually the, the first civilization of the world and the most ancient and the richest. Others had almost a diametrically opposite opinion that Western civilization, especially European, was vastly superior and there was nothing much to be looked at uh, in India's past. Whatever the prejudices, they did a certain thorough job in you know, finding the, the texts, the manuscripts, collecting thousands of manuscripts, shipping them to European libraries, where very often they remained unread, even uncatalogued for a long time. For example, the, the first manuscripts of the Rig Veda, we were told by Professor Kapil Kapoor, I think yesterday, that Rig Veda was meant to be pronounced, spoken, recited, chanted, of course. These are poems, these are songs, in fact, and not written down. Nevertheless, somewhere around the 10th century, uh, there were manuscripts of the Rig Veda written down, though they were not used in the teaching and learning of the Vedas, which remained completely an oral tradition. Nevertheless, it seems clear that some scholars wanted to look at the written text. So manuscripts started being written down and some of them were collected by Europeans in the 18th century in particular, shipped to European libraries, and they were sleeping there while they were still hunting for the Vedas in India. They didn't know that Paris National Library, Royal Library as it was called then, already had the manuscripts. So they were explored in the 19th century. And in the 19th century, uh, we have now vast amount of translations into English, French, Italian, German. I should almost have mentioned German first or second, Russian, and a host of other languages where you see that the, the great texts of India, so a little bit of the Vedas, more of the Upanishads, uh, the Mahabharata Ramayana, quite a lot. Uh, and so on, Panchatantra, and, and a large number of subsequent texts. Now, this provokes a whole 
discovery of a new continent, as Hegel, the German philosopher, put it. Uh, Hegel was actually quite critical of the, of the Indian cultural heritage, but that's another question that we won't go into. Uh, but he recognized that suddenly, suddenly, you know, the, the, the roots, foundations, and to some extent, the developments of Indian civilization were now available to, to, to Europe. And this, this triggered a whole, you know, series of, cha of cultural chain reaction, which unfortunately we won't go into. That's not my topic today. It is a fascinating topic, which I have studied a little bit, especially as far as France is concerned, because uh, the impact of Sanskrit literature on European literatures, uh, French literature in particular was huge. And the whole romantic movement uh, in, in European literature was very largely impacted by, by Sanskrit texts, especially Mahabharata Ramayana. Anyway, that's another topic. But as the British uh, Indologist and Sanskrit is very distinguished, and you can see his, one of his many books on the, on the right side of the screen, Arthur MacDonald, as he puts it, since the Renaissance is referring to the European Renaissance, you know, 15th, 16th century and so on, there has been no such event of such worldwide significance in the history of culture. So he's speaking of Europe as the discovery of Sanskrit literature in the latter part of the 18th century. So that's a absolutely recognized, admitted fact. In fact, there's a book by a French scholar, Raymond Schwab, which is titled The Oriental Renaissance. And uh, a large chunk of it is dedicated to, to India and, and the whole phenomenon of the discovery of Sanskrit, discovery by Europeans again. Very well. So that's a little bit of background. But then, <clears throat> then we're going to see a lot of such testimonies. And I'm skipping hundreds of testimonies of European scholars. Uh, they are listed in some books, and they are very impressive, and they are full of admiration for the richness, uh, rigor of, of the Sanskrit language. But I'm taking Sri Aurobindo, the, the, um, the great, well-known philosopher, thinker, poet, and yogi, and a spiritual pioneer uh, of the mainly 20th century was, was his activity uh, in India. And he says the Sanskrit language itself as has been univers universally recognized by those competent to form a judgment, because many are not competent, is one of the most magnificent, the most perfect, and wonderfully sufficient literary instruments developed by the human mind, at once majestic and sweet and flexible, strong and clearly formed, which is, by the way, an indirect allusion to Panini's grammar, which we were told about uh, in the previous talks, full of vibrant, full and vibrant and subtle, and its quality and character would be of itself a sufficient evidence of the character and quality of the race, he's referring to the Indians, whose mind it expressed, and the culture of which it was the reflecting medium. So Sanskrit as a medium of Indian culture. Obviously not the only medium, that's not what Shomini is trying to say, but a major medium, a major vehicle of the whole of India's cultural heritage. So uh, this is also a famous quote. Anybody who knows its author, you please tell me. If I was asked what is the greatest treasure which India possesses and what is her finest heritage, I would answer unhesitatingly, it is the Sanskrit language and literature and all that it contains. This is a magnificent inheritance. And so long as this endures and influences the life of our people, so long the basic genius of India will continue. Who said this? Excellent. Absolutely. This is Nehru. Uh, and there are several uh, similar quotations by him, Some, most of them in his book, Discovery of India, uh, which where he praises not only the language, but also what it conveyed, what it expressed. So there was at that time, we are talking about, you know, the period of a little bit before independence, after independence, kind of a broad cons consensus. We'll see that again later. And this gentleman, I don't think any of one of you, unfortunately, will be aware of Dr. Dr. Lokesh Chandra, who is still with us at an advanced age now, a fabulous scholar of 
Sanskrit heritage and also is more particularly Buddhism and the whole radiation, migration of Indian ideas, concepts, texts, heritage beyond in India, especially in the rest of Asia. And he says Sanskrit is the thread on which the pearls of the necklace of Indian culture are strung. Break the thread and all the pearls will be scattered. It's a beautiful image, even lost forever, right? So we have this kind of uh, massive consensus. Of course, you can always find a few dissenting voices and we will come to that perhaps briefly later. In fact, we'll have to hear one of them. Uh, but this is, this is the, what faces India at the time of, let's say, independence. And we have more voices, for example, our whole culture, literature, and life would remain incomplete so long as our scholars, our thinkers, and our educationists remain ignorant of Sanskrit. Okay, you will not know, this is by Dr. Rajendra Pasal, the first president of India, as you know, and, and this was one of the many such voices. Sanskrit is not the language of any particular sect or creed, because you see, there was already these voices were coming up that Sanskrit is only the language of one particular caste. I don't have to tell you which one. And it's the language of the elite. And uh, the mass of the Indian population was cut off from Sanskrit. We've had already contrary testimonies from Professor Kapil Kapoor and so on. So here, this is somebody, and this is the former, another former president of India, Fakhruddin Ali Ahmed, who say Sanskrit is not the language of any particular sect or creed. So it's interesting that, yes? I'm coming to that. Good. I'm glad that you're aware of the debate in the Constituent Assembly. Uh, one more, if Sanskrit would be divorced from the everyday life of the masses of this country, a light would be gone from the life of the people. And the distinctive features of Hindu culture, which have won for it an honored place in world thought, would soon be affected to the great disadvantage and loss of both India and the world. Well, this is not a Hindu nationalist. It is actually a, a Muslim statesman uh, who was quite well known in his days. I don't think many of you might have heard of him, uh, Mirza Ismail, and he was the one of the Mysore state uh, uh, at that time. So, so we can multiply those voices. The most surprising, perhaps, is the voice of Dr. Ambedkar. And uh, this has not been sufficiently researched. I was not able to find much information of the background of this um, motion, this proposal which was made in the Constituent Assembly uh, by a group of Sanskrit scholars plus Dr. Ambedkar. Dr. Ambedkar himself declared several times he was not a Sanskrit scholar, but I believe he had quite good foundations in the language and was able to read some texts on his own, uh, though he used also translations. So <clears throat> you can see the cutting of those days. It is actually relayed by PTI, which was already in existence. And uh, most of them, uh, for example, uh, T.T. Krishnamachari uh, of uh, Madras then, and uh, a Bengali Pandit, uh, Lakshmi Kantam Maitra or Moitro, I'm not very sure how to pronounce, um, were people, scholars who intervened in a big debate in the Constituent Assembly as to what should be the status of, of Sanskrit. And you know that the Constituent Assembly was uh, an assembly in 1948-49, which ultimately chalked out the first draft for the Constitution of India. So very, very important debates are there, which you can download from the net. Uh, and uh, very often we should go back to those debates because we see a lot of arguments, which, which we are still you know, having in, in today's intellectual debates. So, so the motion was to make Sanskrit the official language of the Union of India with English as a transitional arrangement. Well, <clears throat> the motion didn't pass. The reason was mostly pragmatic. There was no great opposition to Sanskrit. In fact, everybody kind of agreed that yes, Sanskrit has a fantastic uh, heritage and we should find ways to promote it, but it's not going to be practical. Uh, 
In fact, some even, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Dr. Lakshmi Kantamaitra brought up the parallel of Israel, which was also a new nation struggling to uh, cope with a multilingual context. There were something like 80 languages in the newly formed state of Israel, and there was no common language. English was not. Many, many uh, of the new citizens of that country did not know English. Many did not know Arabic, uh, etc. So they, they actually forged a new language, modern Hebrew, out of the ancient Hebrew. But the language is fairly distinct, much simplified. And, uh, and for that, a, a linguistic commission was formed to thrash this out. So there was a kind of a suggestion that maybe India should do something like this and create a kind of simplified Sanskrit that you know, the whole nation could adopt. The problem was that Israel is a very small country and was dealing, even though it was dealing with 80 languages, uh, they, were, they were just at that time, I, I don't know, a few lakhs of, of citizens. India had crossed. So there were, pragmatism prevailed and Hindi was then declared to be the national language with English as also an, an, an auxiliary um, official language, as you all know. So, so this is uh, an interesting development which we are not uh, sufficiently aware of. Now, we have to look at the, the problem which remained, which was what do we do with Sanskrit? You see, the, the, the modern nation of India had to face this. And someone called Mahatma Gandhi, I will not introduce him, wrote, uh, in fact, I think it was a bit earlier, it was in 1940, but like, let's say independence was in sight almost. Hmm? I belong to a generation which believed in the study of the ancient languages. I do not believe that such a study is a waste of time and effort. You see, already this argument was going about that, why should we waste time? Uh, you know, we need education because we need to, to uh, develop this country. And, uh, you know, we need engineering and we need English and we need uh, maths and so on. Why do we have to spend time on this? So he's actually trying to deal with this argument in his own way. I believe it is an aid, Sanskrit, to the study of modern languages, which is undeniable as far as Indian languages are concerned. This is truer of Sanskrit than of any other ancient language. And he's referring, of course, to languages like Greek or Latin. Uh, which are certainly helpful to studying European languages. If you know Greek or Latin, you will get a much better grasp of German, French, English, and so on. So far as India is concerned, and every nationalist should study it because it makes a study of the provincial languages easier than otherwise. It is the language in which our forefathers thought and wrote. And um, if you run through the collected works of uh, Gandhi. There are 100 volumes available on, online. And just type Sanskrit, which, which I did for the purpose of this talk. Then you will see that he was constantly pushing his followers, whether in his ashram or not, to study Sanskrit. And constantly even reporting on their progress in their studies of Sanskrit. So for him, it was something important. And he himself made the effort of learning the language to a certain decent level of fluency, which he did not have when he, when he reached India. He did not know Sanskrit at that time. So now that is about the study of Sanskrit. And now we see the, also the, the, the modern state of India uh, trying to adopt Sanskrit through a certain set of symbols and uh, uh, mottos like this motto on, on the national emblem. Uh, from Ashoka's pillar, where uh, this uh, Satyam Eva Jayate uh, is inscribed. So there is a kind of a desire to, to promote, but as of as then, there is no clear way forward. What should we do except continuing, you know, the teaching that still happened to be there uh, in, in pre-independent India? So this constant questioning led ultimately a few years later to the constitution of, and this is just you know, a decade after independence, of this Sanskrit commission, 
which uh, was constituted basically by Sanskrit scholars. Maybe it should have had a broader range of, of um, educationists and intellectuals, uh, but, but this is how it was done. And it was created by the Ministry of Education, which was then headed by Maulana Azam. He was the Minister of Education for India. So it gave a massive report. I mean, the basic core of the report is, is, is reasonably short, maybe 80, 90 pages. And then there are lots of additional chapters and ultimately annexures. What does it say? So this is, there are some details which, well, first of all, uh, it, it of course had no doubt about the place of Sanskrit in the heart of Indians. So this is a, a, a non-scholarly, but, uh, a humane way of, of uh, conveying this, the people of India love and venerate Sanskrit. Uh, with a, I think there's a mistake here, next only with the place, next only to that of patriotism towards Mother India. So they are immediately, of course, putting Sanskrit on a high pedestal. And they recall also, I, I, I could go on and on quoting, but we will just uh, take a few essentials. They recall also the veneration that freedom fighters, most of them at least, uh, had for Sanskrit, starting from Bankin Chandra Chatterjee, uh, who composes national song Vande Matram, and uh, who uh, actually composed this song in Sanskrit, with a few Bengali sentences within, as the most natural thing. The place of Sanskrit was so obvious that no one gave any special thought to it. It was still a natural part of uh, Indian life and especially literary activity, even though Bankim wrote primarily, of course, in Bengali. The Indian people and the Indian civilization were born, so to say, in the lap of Sanskrit. It went hand in hand with the historical development of the Indian people and gave the noblest expression to their mind and culture, which has come down to our day as an inheritance of priceless order for India, nay, for the entire world. And this is something a lot of scholars, uh, intellectuals, uh, both from India and from the West insisted upon, that Sanskrit is actually part of uh, humanity's heritage. It's not something that should be seen as just exclusively Indian. First of all, there's a whole linguistic as aspect, which was, of course, mentioned by our previous speakers, that Sanskrit is a, a, a major branch of the Indo-European, the huge Indo-European family of languages. Initially, it was thought to be the origin of that family and the mother of all Indo-European languages, but it was shown linguistically that this is not the case <clears throat> and that there are more ancient uh, steps uh, in, in that huge family. Uh, many of which uh, do not have any literature, but Sanskrit is, is a major branch of the Indo-Aryan subfamily of the Indo-European family. So this is standard stuff, and you can find, if you just look at the Wikipedia article on the Indo-European family of languages, you will have the whole tree, which linguists have patiently recreated. But nevertheless, because... Um, uh, the, the kinship of Sanskrit with the European languages was very obvious, in fact, by one of the very, very first uh, masters of Sanskrit in, in India, European masters, William Jones, British judge, who, who gave some famous declarations on the greatness of Sanskrit in the 1770s in the Asiatic Society of Calcutta. Um, the first thing he noticed is that Sanskrit was somehow very close to Greek and Latin, that there were many cognate words and there were very similar grammatical forms also, which was not the case, for example, with the language like Tamil. That's another issue which uh, we can discuss later. So, so therefore, um, therefore, the, the, um, importance of Sanskrit, not just for India, but for the whole world, is something that this commission report stresses. But then, then it goes, comes back to the actual scene and what to do. And it says, while for all administrative and ordinary day-to-day -day purposes, some pan-Indian form of Hindi 
may be used, it appears inevitable that in the course of time, the prospective all India language, Bharati Bhasha, is a formula which they coined, at least in its written form, which would be acceptable to all regions of India, especially the higher reaches of education and literary activity, will be a form of simple and modernized Sanskrit. So what they are doing here is to propose that, okay, there is, there is Hindi on, on the one hand, but this actually should help us to create a modernized, simplified form of Sanskrit, which then would ultimately become an all Indian language. It did not happen for all kinds of difficulties. Uh, first of all, the presence of non-Sanskritic language in India. These are the, 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 not only the Dravidian languages of South India, but uh, some of the Himalayan languages, some of the Northeast languages, uh, and some of the, uh, some isolate languages of a few tribal communities here and there. Number two, the fact that forging a new language is not an easy task because you have to make sure that it's going to be usable and that somehow um, people are going to adopt it. Language is a living organism. It's not something that you can impose. It's not something that you can, you know, Esperanto, for example, is, and there are three, four other such languages, it's a completely artificial language, which was created. And there are still clubs for Esperanto, uh, there's an Esperanto society somewhere with people meeting every year, so somewhere in the world and discussing in Esperanto. It's a simple language which borrows from different European languages and uh, which uh, the hope being that one day this can become a link language for the whole world. It didn't work. It didn't work because it's, it's again an artificial phenomenon. And, and um, other factors of life, of society are going to ultimately choose what languages are spoken, used, written, and so on. So you can't actually do this. But this was, let us say, the intention. Now we come to the, the, the educational scene more precisely, and, uh, and uh, which, which was already asked, you see, by uh, the Sanskrit Commission and a few earlier thinkers, including Mahatma Gandhi. Now, here again, I go back to Shermindo and I go back to 1920 because he wrote a series of articles on national education. The concern briefly was that, all right, India is fighting for its independence and we'll get it. It's unavoidable. Everybody was convinced that India will get, of course, British Empire. It was clear, except to the British for a while, that it cannot last forever. And, you know, we are in a different. Uh, period, and all these colonized nations will get independence. Now, what will we do with our independence is a question that quite a few freedom fighters started thinking about. It's very nice to attain independence, but then what do you do with it? If you uh, claim independence, it should be for a certain set of objectives of how you see India growing, developing. Right, well, that's too big a question for today, but as far as education is concerned, this is what he wrote in 1920. And the vital question is how we are to learn and make use of Sanskrit. So that's exactly the question which is still being discussed today after almost 100 years. And the indigenous languages. So he's not just limiting the question to Sanskrit. This is great foresight that, you know, he's aware that, that India has many languages. So as to get to the heart and intimate sense of our own culture and establish a vivid continuity between the still living power of our past, still living power of our past, the past is not dead, the cultural heritage is, is still living, and the yet uncreated power of our future, which is actually a bigger question. And how we are to learn and use English, you see, he does not rule out that English might continue or any other foreign tongue, so as to know helpfully the life, ideas, and culture of other countries and establish our right relations with the world. So he doesn't want India to you know, be an isolated uh, place. Uh, he wants the, these, these contacts which the colonial era, uh, for good or bad, has opened up with the rest of the world. He wants those contacts to, to thrive. 
around us. This is the aim and principle of a true national education, not certainly to ignore modern truth and knowledge, but to take our foundation on our own being, our own mind, our own spirit. So therefore we have a whole in nutshell, a beautiful um, summary of his philosophy of education, uh, which <clears throat> we find, and I'm coming to that shortly, uh, to a large extent reflected in the national education policy and all its predecessors. National education policy of 2020, exactly 100 years later. And uh, we, we have the same philosophy expressed there that yes, uh, education must prepare young Indians to face, interact with, be active in the modern world. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it should be disconnected from the, uh, the cultural inheritance of India. It should be very obvious because this is something that most uh, Western countries are doing. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, British uh, school children uh, have to imbibe quite a lot about uh, British culture and the same with the French and the same with the German. And it's regarded as natural, but not exclusive in any way of exposure to the rest of the world. So I think this is an important um, uh, set of thoughts, which, you know, we can read and reread and meditate upon. Now, about education, I'm going back for a moment to the Sanskrit Commission, because it, it tries to lay out some program, which is not going to happen. And it says the study of Sanskrit in modern schools is often objected to on the score that that study is not useful. The same thing that Gandhi was also trying to address. <clears throat> it is true that the pressure of time and money, economic factors, on the one hand, we are in 1957. Huh? It's a completely different India, which you have not known at all, of course. And the claims of a large number of subjects as constituting the necessary minimum of general education or the other, are likely to compel us to prune and select and give priority to such subjects as yield quick results and material gains. Remember, this is about building India. India is a very poor country. Uh, there are millions living in, in dire uh, situations. Uh, and the question is, how do, we, how do we create a modern nation now uh, 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 as quickly as possible? And this, this reflects that view. Sanskrit may not yield tangible material results, but it does influence in an intangible manner the molding of the character and the personality of a pupil, a school student. And actually, this is a debate that is still uh, ongoing and which the National Education Policy of 2020 tries to address. It's about what's the use of education after all. And, um, you know, uh, is Sanskrit necessary? I once heard an uh, education minister of Tamil Nadu government many years ago declaring that we should do away with history. It's no use. Why, why do we burden students with history? And we can go on, actually. Why a geography? You, can, you have Google Maps. You can, you know, you have Wikipedia. Anything you need, you can, you can go and learn it. You can keep pruning quite a lot of topics. And in fact, you know, even a lot of our engineering students here at IIT Gandhinagar want to go for USPC exams, become a civil servant, where they will never use any of their, civ you know, civil engineering or mechanical engineering. Uh, they will go to banking where they just need how to make a sum or a subtraction. They don't need advanced mathematics, which they've been learning, no need of calculus and, and all that stuff. So the whole question of usefulness of you know, education um, is actually to be looked at at a different level. And if it's only for jobs, then we can close all our education institutions. Schools and universities are unnecessary. We can just have skilling centers. You decide your job early on. In a few years, you learn it. At the age of 14, 15, you can start a profession. Why not? And in fact, it can happen with some, uh, you know, uh, technical professions and does happen. There is vocational institution, uh, institutions for those who don't want to go through the whole uh, schooling. Now, these are big questions which have been addressed all over the world. They're not particular to India at all. 
And the general philosophy, prevailing philosophy, is that education is for some higher purpose. It's not just to learn a job, because actually you're not going to learn a job. You will learn the job, you know, hands-on, later on. So it's, it's, it's only if you are really, uh, you know, an electrical engineer getting employed in an electrical industry that, yes, you've been prepared to some extent. But I think if we took statistics, we'll find that this is not a large proportion of, of our students. So therefore, therefore, uh, the, the prevailing philosophy, especially in the national education policy of, of uh, 2020, is that education is really to nourish the student at all levels and at the level of, of the, the character, but at, at the level of understanding cultures, being able to cope with, with uh, life, real life situations, with the world, uh, and so on. And this is something that cannot be taught with just teaching mathematics and, and you know, STEM, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. That cannot be sufficient. Otherwise, we can also throw out all the arts, uh, all literature, none of this is, is useful. And then once you face the first crisis in life, you're defeated because you're not equipped. So this is, this is a broad worldwide consensus education has to, so vocabulary varies from one country to another. In the US, it will be all about personality development. Uh, in other countries, some other formula may be favored, but it comes to the same. So here, according to the Sanskrit Commission, Sanskrit has a role to play for Indians. Now. It also says that, and this is the pedagogical aspect that we are coming to now, that there is a widespread impression, and many witnesses confirm that impression, that Sanskrit is a very, because they interviewed a lot of people, this commission you know, went through, and all this is annexed in their report, that Sanskrit is a very difficult language to acquire, and a vast amount of effort is required to master it sufficiently well to read advanced texts by oneself. A language that is not in common use is indeed somewhat difficult to learn. Okay. But it is needlessly made more difficult because of wrong and unsuitable methods of teaching. And this is a very important point because, unfortunately, across India, this has not been addressed. I have met many, many students, you know, who studied some Sanskrit at school, found it a pain, found it boring, and basically did not carry anything beyond their schooling. So therefore, uh, this message was not heard, and the educational uh, bodies in India, which uh, design the policies and the teacher training policies and the pedagogy and so on, did not do their job. On the basis of the evidence tendered before us by a number of experts, some of whom were teachers of long standing, and some who had evolved special methods of teaching the language, and on the basis of our own observation of the teaching in the Patashala schools and universities, we think that there is considerable scope for rationalization in this regard. Such rationalization would result in increasing the interest in learning Sanskrit and in improving the standard of Sanskrit scholarship at various levels. So in other words, they are pleading for what we call today innovative pedagogies. I'll come back to that quickly, shortly. So now we jump to the more recent context, but don't think that 2020 national education policy comes in a void. There were many educational policies in independent India, uh, which basically remained policies on paper. Why? Because a policy is just a car without its wheels. It won't run on its own. You need to work out the ways. You need to work out the whole detail implementation of it, which is what at present a committee is trying to do for the national education policy. And within a year or two, its curriculum framework for the implementation of the national education policy should be ready. And this is supposed to take care of all those aspects. So providing the wheels to the car. So the car has evolved a lot, and national education policy is a, is a very uh, profound and forward-looking document, which I invite you to read. But there were antecedents, and as far as Sanskrit is concerned, 1968, 
Considering the special importance of Sanskrit to the growth and development of Indian languages and its unique contribution to the cultural unity of the country, so this repeats what we have seen already several times, facilities for its teaching at the school and university stages should be offered on a more liberal basis. More liberal, provide facilities. <coughs> development of new methods of teaching the language should be encouraged. You see this call for good teaching methods uh, stimulating methods is, is, is voiced long ago. And the possibility explored of including the study of Sanskrit in those courses, such as modern Indian philosophy, at the first and second degree stages where such knowledge is useful. We'll come back to this in a moment. 1986, almost 20 years later, because nothing has happened in the meantime. Almost no change worth noting. 1986, a big attempt to formulate a new education policy. And there will be some ripples, like the Kendriya Vidyalayas will be partly inspired, like the Navodaya schools, if you ever heard of this, like the national open school system. There will be some implementation, stray implementations of this new education policy of 1986, but not that much to, to talk about. Now, what does it say? It says, Research in Indology. Indology is basically the study of India's cultural heritage. The humanities and social sciences will receive adequate support to fulfill the need for the synthesis of knowledge. Interdisciplinary research, now this is perhaps one of the first time that this word is used. You know, interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, cross-disciplinarity are terms that we use all the time now. But it took time to, to realize, though it was expressed without those terms earlier, but it took time to realize that keeping disciplines in silos, in compartments, is absolutely a way to kill edu good education. You should always be able to cut across to other fields. And we belong to an institute here which has you know, claimed to promote multidisciplinary studies in various ways. Um, efforts will be made to delve into India's ancient fund of knowledge and to relate it to contemporary reality, you see, to create relevance, if you like. This effort will imply the development of facilities for the intensive study of Sanskrit. Now, before we come to the uh, national education policy of, 19, of 2020, uh, we must uh, have one in, in entertaining interlude where uh, some people went to court uh, to protest about Sanskrit being proposed as an elective course, not even mandatory, as an elective uh, in, in CBSC uh, and other boards, uh, school boards of India. And we have two... Supreme Court judges, Kuldeep Singh, you see him uh, on the right, and B. L. Ansaria, giving a judgment which is fairly brief. It's about its operative page, just eight pages or so. You can read it on, on, online, and it's, it's really something quite fascinating. But the argument was that teaching Sanskrit at school was unsecular. Or if you are going to teach it, then it should have equal status with Arabic or Persian, which are equal classic, equally classical languages of India. So they deal with this. And basically, I'll just sum up the operative part of the, of the judgment. By, they refer to the Sanskrit Commission of India. They also refer to some of the Western scholars on Sanskrit. And this is what they say. From what has been stated above, we entertain no doubt in our mind that teaching of Sanskrit alone as an elective subject, please see it's about elective, it's not about imposing Sanskrit, can in no way be regarded as against secularism. The argument was flawed. By the way, I've not been able to find the original petition. I, I looked for it. Uh, I could not. I hope to trace it one day. Uh, they mentioned brief you know, arguments, but not the whole thing. And the idea was that uh, teaching sans Sanskrit is basically a language of religion, and therefore should not be taught uh, because we want a secular education. Now, the argument is flawed at every step because as we already saw in the previous talks, Sanskrit is not a language of religion. It's just a language of everything. 
It's a language of architecture, of, of chemistry, of maths and astronomy, of course, of polity, of agriculture, of all the technical subjects, including the arts, of course, and grammar and whatnot. So, so the whole argument is flawed. And, uh, and then this is how they conclude that in view of the importance of Sanskrit for nurturing our cultural heritage, so this is the, the line being followed right from you know, the, the, the freedom fighters, because of which even the official education policy has highlighted the need of study of Sanskrit, they are referring to the 1986 policy. Making of Sanskrit alone as an elective subject while not conceding this status to Arabic and or Persian would not in any way militate against the basic tenet of secularism. So they threw out the petition. So now we go back to the, the last part of my talk, uh, back because I've already mentioned some of, of the points which of foundations that this uh, national education policy <clears throat> rests upon. There's a larger document which is called Draft National Education Policy of uh, 2019, which is longer, more extensive, and it is also available online. And <clears throat> now I have to read a few extracts, please bear with me, but that's, that's the best way to, to continue the discussion. Uh, First of all, it, re it recommends <clears throat> a lot of activities. It recommends that the, the teaching must be enjoyable for all subjects. It should be experiential. The students at all levels and for all subjects should be confronted as much as possible with hands-on activities, projects, and basically getting involved with the subject. So they absolutely throw out the question of having a teacher monologuing to the students who have to be passive recipients and silent most of the time. So this is one example of a project on languages of India. It's not about Sanskrit alone. Students will learn about the remarkable unity of most of the major Indian languages, starting with their common phonetic and scientifically arranged alphabets and scripts. They are referring to what Professor Kapil Kapoor was saying about you know, the, the Devanagari alphabet which is very largely followed by South Indian languages also. You know, the, the way you start from the deepest location in the throat and then move on to ultimately the labial sounds, uh, you know, pa, ba, at the end and so on, ma, and so on. Um, <clears throat> their common grammatical structures, the origins and sources of vocabularies from Sanskrit and other classical languages, as well as their rich inter-influences and differences. They will also learn what geographical areas speak which languages, get a sense of the nature and structure of tribal languages, and learn to say commonly spoken phrase, phrases and sentences in every major language of India, and also learn a bit about the rich and uplifting literature of each through suitable translations as necessary. Because obviously, if a Tamil student is to be exposed to a little bit of Bengali culture, uh, it will not be immediately possible in Bengali. So you need to use translations, but it, it insists on translations across Indian languages more than translations into English, because they are easier most of the time, and they are most of the time also more faithful to the spirit of the original. Such act, an activity would give them both a sense of the unity and the beautiful cultural heritage and diversity of India, and would be a wonderful icebreaker their whole lives as they in their own lives as they meet people from other parts of India. Uh, but more seriously, now we have this passage. The importance, relevance, and beauty of the classical languages and literature of India cannot be overlooked. And please note that it speaks of the classical languages in plural. So Sanskrit is not the only classical language of India, and this is completely accepted by the national education policy. Sanskrit, while also an important modern language mentioned in the eighth schedule of the Constitution of India, that's a fact, possesses a classical literature that is greater in volume than that of Latin and Greek, Greek put together, containing vast treasures of mathematics, philosophy, grammar, etc. I'm going to skip over this because we have already mentioned that. Uh, written by people of various religions as well as non-religious people and by people from all walks of life and a wide range of socioeconomic backgrounds over thousands of years. 
Sanskrit will thus be offered at all levels of school and higher education as an important and enriching option, not as a mandatory subject. For students, including as an option in the three language formula, right? It will be taught in ways that are interesting and experiential. So this word experiential comes a lot in the national education policy because the, the student has to experiment with all the learning that he or she is exposed to. Otherwise, it's, it's just mechanical. As well as contemporarily relevant, including through the use of Sanskrit knowledge systems and in particular through phonetics and pronunciation. And finally, <clears throat> Because we've been talking about national integration ever since independence, even before, in fact. But it's, we've not used the, the, the rich instrument of Indian languages in, in this respect. India has also an extremely rich literature in other classical languages, including classical Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, Malayalam, Odia. In addition to these classical languages, Pali, Persian, and Prakrit. And their works of literature too must be preserved for their richness and for the pleasure and enrichment of posterity. As India becomes a fully developed country, the next generation will want to partake in and be enriched by India's extensive and beautiful classical literature. Uh, I can skip the rest, I think you've understood. And basically through experiential and innovative approaches, we must ensure that these languages and literature stay alive and vibrant. Similar efforts will be made for all Indian languages having rich oral and written traditions, cultural traditions, and knowledge. Now, you may ask, how is it possible to do all of this? You know, within the limited scope, and, and national education policy is also talking about reducing the load of the curriculum because it's universally accepted that the school curriculum load in India is far too much, far too heavy for students to really absorb or assimilate in an intelligent way. So we're talking at the same time of exposure to all. So this is what the curriculum framework now under elaboration is trying to work out. Having cut off, cut a lot of this in uh, disciplines or within disciplines, for example, in physics, maths, reducing by at least 30% the curriculum to make space for other things, how to, uh, what instrumental instrumentalization to use to expose Indian students to other languages and also to their heritage. I once for fun in, in Tamil Nadu schools, I asked students to give us any literature figure for any other from any other Indian language. And most of the time there was no reply. Sometimes somebody mentions Tagore because yes, he appears in, in, in school textbooks. Uh, uh, but uh, even from the neighboring state of Kerala, they were invariably unable to mention a single great literary figure of Kerala. And we have been talking about national integration all those years. So <clears throat> therefore, I will just sum up this long quotation about how uh, this promotion of Sanskrit can be perhaps worked out, but it's not yet fully of course, operational, and where it is through schools, but also through um, uh, departments of Sanskrit, uh, but also through interdisciplinary research on Sanskrit and Sanskrit knowledge systems, where, and this is the last sentences which, which are more important, Sanskrit will become a natural part of a holistic, multidisciplinary higher education if a student so chooses. So not just school, but they are now looking at higher education, where Sanskrit teachers in large numbers will be professionalized across the country in mission mode through the offering of a four-year integrated multidiscipline B. Ed. dual degree in education and Sanskrit. So this is one proposal. Whether it will work out in the end remains to be seen. Now I'll summarize uh, this this uh, longish talk uh, with a few salient points, and um, and. To, to basically sum up the status of Sanskrit in uh, Indian education, not only today, but hopefully tomorrow, and how the roadmap can be unfolded. So first of all, it's not about imposition. And nowhere in the national education policy will you find uh, imposition of any language for that matter. 
So anybody who says the contrary has not read the document. Just read it. It's as simple as that. Number two, do not teach Sanskrit as something which is cut off from the rest. The challenge is to teach Sanskrit with some of its multidisciplinary ramification, which of course demands a lot of knowledge from the teacher, not just pure language knowledge, not just pure grammar or uh, you know, a few basic texts, but also how Sanskrit was an instrument to develop knowledge or express knowledge in a whole lot of fields which we have briefly uh, listed. Uh, and, and, and therefore, how Sanskrit still holds a potential for exploring uh, diverse disciplines. And in fact, this course here will have more scholars that will be speaking more specifically about the presence of Sanskrit today in the arts, for example, this is coming up shortly, uh, in science, in uh, various fields uh, of, of uh, today's society. <clears throat> Integration of other disciplines in other disciplines in higher education. So we are not sure yet what UGC or its successor, if it is revamped as, as national education policy demands, um, what policy exactly it will adopt. But there has been a study to, to, to suggest how Sanskrit can be naturally integrated in a number of disciplines without creating too much of a burden of Sanskrit as a separate discipline, which would be more for specialization, for those students who want to go deeper. But those who don't want to can still be exposed to the contribution of Sanskrit in a range of fields of knowledge. Then the challenge of pedagogies. <laughs> Teaching Sanskrit in a boring way with you know all the tenses and all the case endings and all the Sandhi rules and so on and so forth, of course they have to come up. But if you do just that, then you are putting off uh, students. And it's not just for Sanskrit, it's the same with, with, with German or, or French. And the teaching, for example, of a language like French is much more difficult than a teaching of a language like, than Sanskrit because it, it is far more irregular than, than uh, Sanskrit is. So, so it's, it's, it's about pedagogy of language. This is no longer about Sanskrit alone. Any language you have to, mix it up and, and you know, first of all, maybe throw the language on the student and then build it up from bottom up instead of having a top-down approach. But this is uh, luckily something which has been addressed and um, uh, we have a number of innovative methods already in use, uh, some in, institu in institutions, others on the internet, and, and this is something where at least a good amount of work has been done. My last point is, what are the cognitive aspects of Sanskrit education? You see, when I learned Latin in a French school, and I was going to, to take the scientific line later, you know, I was going to go for maths and physics and so on. When I learned Latin at school, the same questions were asked, what's the use of learning Latin? And, uh, you know, I remember my teacher saying that those who learn Latin well will be good at maths. They will be good at maths because there's a rigor, there's a logic, there's a structure. And I found that this was largely true. It develops certain cognitive abilities which are useful in other fields. It's as simple as that. Uh, how does our brain work? It doesn't break, you know, it's not that you have one part of the brain working on, on mass and another part completely separate working on, on, on a language. So these cognitive abilities need to be researched more deeply. There's been a good amount of research already done and in fact, uh, there I have to say that uh, Western universities are leaders. And Professor Srinivas really told us that maybe more re Sanskrit research is happening abroad than in India. Uh, it's quite possible. I mean, we can't easily quantify, but uh, we have seen a lot of very interesting research, for example, on the effects of Sanskrit learning on the brain, you know, with the brain scans being taken and the pa research papers have been published even the effects uh, of uh, Vedic chanting on the, on the brain uh, and so on and so forth. So there's a good deal of, of research being done. And I think that India should be a leader rather than being a follower in this and, uh, and could easily establish that, you know, there are lots of benefits from learning Sanskrit, not just learning the language, 
not just having access to the literature as Professor Kapil Kapoor told us, a vast amount of Sanskrit literature is available in English and other languages. So it's not just for that, it's, it's also for the enrichment that it brings, and it's also for the development of cognitive uh, abilities that perhaps we do not always suspect. So I will close with this, and if we have questions, uh, I'll try to answer them, to deal with them. Thank you.